Wake your ass up or take a damn nap. And we're the three best friends that anybody could have. It's time. You were t- I mean, Sean, you were twerking. That's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Murph, don't be a dick all your life. This is uh, one, of, one of the more fun podcasts I've ever done. Hey, I'll tell you what. If you're not talking about sports in the man cave, you... No, I bet not. So you're not a man. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> For y'all to see that and laugh along with us, you know, you know, I was laughing recording. I don't know if you saw the, the phone shaking because I was just like, oh, you know, I did. <laughs> There's other people here who are bad for the culture, period. They got to go. You recording stuff like that, you got to go, bro. That's my guy, Stephen and Gotti. I think a lot of us have said that over here the last two weeks. You got to go, bro. Right you got to go. Uh, Bo Davis incident, which is. Steven, you know, that's common in a football locker room. And, and I loved your take on that, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. It, it's, it's, it's not only is it common, I mean, it's common in a lot of sports, right? And especially that bus ride, you know, at the high school, we all think about Friday Night Lights, that brutal bus ride home after a hard fought game and you take a L and you're in there with your brothers or, you know, the ladies with their sisters after the game and it's tough. And the last thing you want is guys, let alone, you know, just acting like it, it doesn't matter, it doesn't care, and those type of things. And I think Bo Davis really tapped into all the emotions that we as fans had. And I think a, a lot of players on the team had. So be curious to, to get more into that, Sean. I can't wait. And this is long overdue. And I for let's just let it be known. Truth be told, I have watched you from afar for about a year. And again, you were one of the factors who inspired me to turn this podcast into a video platform and much love and appreciation for that. 100%. <laughs> so stories inside the man cave podcast, episode 103. Uh, we have quite a family now of sponsors and partners, and I definitely want to give a shout out to the newest one, farmhouse delivery, ATX based. Uh, if you are into uh, organic produce, organic meats grown in Texas, go to farmhousedelivery.com. Fill your card up. I mean, I just finished their first, my first produce order. I made five meals out of it. And I had never had turnips. Well, I hadn't had turnips in 20 years. Pretty good. Pretty good. And use the man cave as your promo code. 20% off your first order. And it's a little late to do it for Thanksgiving dinner, but start thinking about Christmas. There we go. Mr. Ngati, um, yes, sir. before we, we're going to save all the Longhorn talk for a, a, a longer segment too, because you have quite an insight, a, quite an opinion, and, and, and quite a some insightful knowledge, if you will, that I want to tap into because I, I, I really, really value your opinion on that. But you being the Howard U, one of the historic HBCUs in the United States, a graduate of Howard, what brought you to Austin? I love hearing how people arrive in this town. I mean, it took me 22 years to get back to my hometown, Austin. I just want to hear how you decided where Austin would maybe be your permanent home, if that's what it is. So <clears throat> here's, here's the, here's the, here's the journey guys. And, and I appreciate you asking Sean. I grew up in Washington, DC. So uh, Washington DC area, I grew up in Silver Spring, Maryland, but you know, we, we lived in and out of, of DC proper. And my mother was actually, is, is actually from Lockhart, Texas. Is that? <laughs> yes. Wow. You know, so barbecue capital of the world. Uh, I know, I know the the rankings and everything has changed over the years, but people that know about Lockhart Barbecue, Smitty's, Christ, the whole bit down there, Blacks, uh, that's that's where our our origin of my mother's side of the family. So my mother is down there, Lockhart, Texas. She actually was a part of the second high school class of at Lockhart, where they were fully integrated. And she was a salutatorian and our family, once they saw Earl Campbell play football for the first time, my pawpaw, my, my mama, like everybody, Texas fans. 
And so once she, you know, achieved that accomplishment coming out of high school, she was accepted to the University of Texas mm -hmm. and went to the University of Texas. And from there, you know, ended up having a career in, in, in the field of medicine and moved to D.C. and had me. Mm -hmm. But from childhood, I was always a Texas fan because yeah. of my mother. And my mother was a super, super Longhorn fan. Like I said, going back to their old Campbell days. So because of family and Lockhart, though, my family, my, my pawpaw is actually still there. I would always come for Thanksgiving or Christmases and we'd always fly into Austin. Right. So I was somewhat familiar with the area, but I, I remember coming. This is uh, Halloween 2011. I came for the first time by myself as an adult to go to DK. I wanted to experience Austin just yeah. in, its, in, in its full glory as a 23 year old, right? Come down, I think it's Texas, Kansas. I, I made sure I picked the game where I, I felt good about it. We'll get into it. <laughs> well, everyone it. felt good about it two weeks ago. That right, 10 years ago, <laughs> what an issue. <laughs> um, so come down 2011, and that was like, I think when they had like Joe Bergeron at running yeah. back and Malcolm Brown and some of those guys and Texas team rolls them, go out, Halloween night with my cousin, have a blast. And I tell him, I'll be back here within a year. And six months later, packed up my car, left DC, came to Austin, found a sales role, was very blessed and fortunate about that, and made Austin my home ever since. I just recently, within the last four months, bought a house though in the DFW area in Arlington. So, but my whole thank you, thank you. First time home, first time homeowner. So very excited about that. But um, that's been my journey ever since then. I've loved, but Austin, I, I consider home. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. It, it took me two decades to get back after I left uh, after high school. And it's, you know, I think it's great to get away, to experience other places and live and see. And you really get to see how other people are. Then it makes you appreciate places like this much more, regardless if it's grown. Uh, uh, 50% more in the last five years, but hey, it's still a great place. And DFW, the same. It's uh, all the I-35 corridor. You buy real estate like you did anywhere near the I-35 corridor. It's, from what I gather, I, I think a, a common surface level thinker like me as far as real estate, I think you <laughs> made a sound decision, my friend. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. My wife and I are thrilled and very excited. Like I said, Austin's home. I met my wife in Austin. Yeah. I found my identity in Austin. I started Fanatic Perspective in Austin. I got, you know, part of it wasn't just because Austin was awesome. It's because the Texas Longhorns are there. Yeah. I'm a huge Texas fan. Right. And so I wanted to be down there, you know, 104, the horn, all the all the the, the things, all the atmosphere, all the local stuff. I wanted to be immersed in that. And you talk about how much Austin grows. I feel like Austin's one of those cities, at least when I got there, it was, you t you take ownership, you become a local real quick. Yeah. You know, you're unique. Cause you, you went to Anderson, yeah. you know, you're, yeah. you're like, you're like one of the unicorns out there. That's like, Big really unicorn from Austin. Horn. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a rare breed, a rare breed. I didn't know the rest what of us just meant. jump in at some point. <laughs> I didn't know what that meant. Someone caught, kept, I kept hearing the term unicorn, unicorn the first two years back. And I was like, huh. And then, so I finally, I, 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 you know, it's one of those laughs, like whatever. I don't know what that means. I don't care. And then I saw finally asked. And so it all came together. It made sense. I realized how much of a minority I am in the fact that there's not many people who have, were born and raised here who live here, but that's okay. I like being different. Like being, well, I, I am a little weird. There's no doubt about it. A little different from everybody else, somewhat. But yeah, and it's uh, you know, it, it, your your our lives paths are pretty impressive, and I, and I like your path. You know what what inspired you other than being a fan to become a Longhorn Sports content producer? Because the fanatic perspective, you guys got to go follow them. You know, you need to subscribe to. Steven's YouTube page, go to his Twitter handle. I think you're on Instagram as well. Yes, sir. And, and, and how many episodes a week do you think you drop on YouTube? Uh, probably at least three. At oh, least three a week. Amazing. That's work, buddy. 
It is. It is. <laughs> On top of having a, a full-time career, as we were discussing beforehand, <laughs> right? So, um, but when, when you're passionate about something and you love doing it, is, is it how much work is it, right? Yeah, you know, is it really just, work? <laughs> exactly. So we, um, in terms of the start of Fanatic Perspective, I wanted to be very similar to what, what, what Mike Barnes was talking about on a previous episode. I always envisioned myself as a sportscaster, sports broadcaster growing up. I uh, went to Howard uh, for broadcast journalism, actually. There was, you know, where I am today, people would think, oh, he was definitely a business major, right? Or, or, or some something related. In, right. In the field I would think so as well. Nope. Uh, I was there for sports. I was a school. I was an editor on the school newspaper on top of being a football player. Like, I was always, always saw myself on the media-ish side mm -hmm. of things. Uh, I always saw myself more as a writer, though. I never thought I'd be, like, you know, a broadcast. I thought I'd go to the NFL and, like, work a beat and, you know, do that whole thing, right? And so you don't know what you don't know when you're younger. But uh, when I got to, to Austin, one of the things my buddy Tran, who I co-host with all the time, shout out to John Tran, we uh, we we were on the same team at the at that time. We met each other as we were also Spurs fans. So we met each other at a Spurs watch party when they were like in the around the time that finals and all that type of stuff. And um, people heard us just talking about the Longhorns, and they're like, "You guys need to record yourselves. Like, you guys should record yourselves. Like, this is y'all are not just like talking like." casual people talk right and so it started off as me writing stuff and figuring it out and eventually i got online my first video is actually boxing related it was canelo triple g reaction video on youtube my very first youtube video but um tom herman came on board and, and it was a new regime new seeming new energy around the fan base and, and just what we were expecting coming off the charlie strong era yeah and it was when we lost to Maryland. And I, for, me being from there, College Park is about 15 minutes from where I grew up. My brother's a diehard Maryland fan. <laughs> it hurt so much that I had to, I had to, I had to get on camera. And I said it was just a therapeutic release because I'm, I was like, let me journal my thoughts and see if anybody out there is with me on this, right? And so from there, the response from everybody it just was so encouraging and people always asking, hey, could you enlighten us on this or could you share your thoughts on this in regards to the team and how things are going? And, you know, it's just grown from there really since Tom Herman's, I would say, his second season. No, it's impressive. I look back, I didn't realize how many episodes that you have. And that, that's what's impressive to me. But again, you say it's not work. It is. You enjoy doing it. But I have to tell you this, too. And. And this is not a knock on my former career industry. We are at a time frame right now that you don't need to be employed by local TV to have a platform. We have so many opportunities. I wish you and I would have had Instagram, Twitter, and all that in our late teens, early 20s. Because can you imagine what we could have established and built by then? Because there are people who are hired on these networks now who can work from home just right. to partake in specialty shows because of their social media presence. It's pretty amazing, actually. It's incredible how much tech has immersed itself into this, right? And the growth of a lot of these media companies and how people can just leverage a following. I mean, even the way people get information today yeah. I've never wanted to knock because I, I, I watch LHN. I watch all these other networks and stuff. I've never wanted to knock those things, but access where, you know, people can DM me on Twitter and I can either respond to you or, or send you a video. Like there's just immediate access and credibility that we have, especially when you come off genuine, especially when you can relate to folks and people are feeling what you're feeling. It's not People feel right now, and again, not a knock to, to large national media, but uh, some of the stuff can be scripted. Some of the stuff, it's like, oh, you're supposed to take this side, or you're trying to drive a narrative. Or I don't think anyone's ever watched my channel, whether you agree with me about something or not, and think that I'm trying to drive any type of narrative, right? So that 
in co combination with tech, allowing people to get quicker access. It's amazing, Sean. No, it is. And it's really, it's helped inspire me. It helped me really see the other side the last two and a half years. Cause I, you're, you're in uh, with Dell, a, a huge corporation. I'm in a mid-level pharmaceutical sales company out of Georgia, but we still have this on the side. So you and I really don't have a lot of downtime when you look at other people, their opinions of us. We do have downtime. We enjoy doing this, people. We, we love it. this. Um, before we move on to the best part of segment one, I, I, I have you been on the south side? Have you heard of Cosmic Coffee and Beer Garden on the south side of Austin? I have. Okay. I have. Enlighten okay. us, Sean. Okay. So I know it's the Ander – you mentioned I went to Anderson. It's one of the uh, – Anderson Trojan Thai. The Paulo Vesey, he started this about three or four years ago. Um, and it is honestly, we're spoiled in Austin with the coffee joints, the Java, the espresso cafes, everything. But uh, they are one of the OGs of the, sponsoring this uh, podcast. They've helped us. Paul has been tremendous. And he's actually helped me put together um, a joint 1990-1991 reunion coming up in December. And all of our friends, you're invited, Stephen. It's on December 4th. Oh, and I can't tell everybody, you know. It's in December. <laughs> and it's at this place right here. Place is pretty phenomenal. Boozy coffee, everything. They have local brews, craft beers. Well, I mean, what's your flavor? That's oh, Ooh. I mean, I'm more of a uh, when it comes to beer, I'm more of a hef guy. But when we, hey, you know, we we can talk about some other beers on here, but you know, I'm more of a hef guy. But you know, just the the atmosphere. Like you said there, man, I'm excited for, for Cosmic and everything they got going on, brother. That's hey, awesome. A, hey, he's about to open up a new location on the east side, uh, more of a sports uh, bar, and that's going to be our, more of our jam. We'll, we'll, we'll make the transition over there and away from Cosmic. It's going to be in that Saltillo district of East Austin. Looking forward to it. Um, Great culture now, over there, too. Oh, it Great is. culture over there. Oh, it's amazing. If people would just take the time and embrace – the history of that area of East Austin and a great vibe with the bars and restaurants. Love it. That's where our big Mike, one of the uh, man cave uh, OGs kind of lives in that district. He and his wife and his beautiful baby boy live in the, on the East side. And it's God, that's a, that is a fun part of East Austin. That really is. So my favorite part before we dive into the most anticipated piece uh, the Jim Saxton State Farm Insurance Agency man cave story. You played football at Howard, who, by the way, you're an FCS brother like me, one double A. And do you have any man cave stories maybe involving the Howard Bison locker room or your career, or maybe uh, a man cave story from the fanatic perspective since you've launched that? So um, Howard, Howard Wise, I actually was was more managing and whatnot at that oh, point. Okay. Yes, I suffered. I suffered. And a lot of people don't know this. Very bad scoliosis. I had a spinal Ooh. fusion my senior year of high school. That's so tough. Ended ended those dreams. But it was, it was so long ago, you can't find any, you know, you can't even find newspapers about this stuff anymore, right? It's just like <laughs> things of the past, things of things of legend, Sean, things yeah. of legend. <laughs> Um, but in terms of, of, of man cave stories, I will say, um, just the, the channel and the exposure that we've had at games, um, the spring game, I want to say two years ago, going to tech, uh, you know, the Texas spring game and the amount of pictures and the amount of feedback and the amount of, of thoughts and emails and things that flood in just from people that recognize me because my face is on YouTube. Right. And it's like, I don't even think we were at like 10,000 subscribers at that point. <laughs> I really don't. I really don't. But I was just, you know, walking around and, and 
you know, my wife and and she she at this point she's thinking it's this little sports hobby thing he does on the side. You know, I ain't he ain't whatever. And to see, you know, a kid, 11 year old come up and take a picture and then a gentleman who's in his 50s and 60s that watches and, you know, tells me their hand, their YouTube handle. And I'm like, oh, you're commenting all the time. Right. And those are that's that's so inspiring just to want to make more. Right. And want to correct, you know, man. serve the community more. But it was that spring game. Of, uh, it was uh, I think it was the last like spring game of Tom Herman's. Or, no, the one before COVID. But 2019 spring game, where I was like, wow, this is this is pretty cool what we're doing here. That's impressive. You know, that's significant growth. And that that is pretty uh, cool when you realize, you know what I'm doing? I've I've discovered the secret sauce on how to grow this. And you've done it. You maintained it. It's called about persistence. So kids, persistence persistence pays off. So kids, you just got a free lesson on how to become a significant presence on YouTube from the Stephen Ngati. Stick with it. Continue to do it. And when you think you're about to quit or people say, man, what are you doing? Look at Stephen and Gotti now. And by the way, go to Fanatic Perspective. Subscribe. Follow them. Like them. Share. And do the same for stories inside the Man Cave podcast. Absolutely. <laughs> look at the look at the guests that, that, that Sean has on. Right? I'm, I, hey, I, I'm on my way up. But, you know, you've had some... Big, big, big people on here, uh, ladies and, and, and gentlemen on on your on your show and this channel and this podcast. So, guys, follow, subscribe, <laughs> share with a friend, whole bit. I appreciate you, brother. It means a lot. We probably should partner up on on some type of a project. I'm sure you you're the, you would be the brains, of course. I just have these random creative ideas. <laughs> But hey, I need more creative people to work with. So oh let's do it. Oh my God. I, Say I less. I'm in. Few, but I'm not many, but maybe a few will, we, we can hit a home run on. <laughs> um, the people, and something that you and I, we're really excited about. And we're going to talk about everything Texas football related because I have been patiently waiting for this episode to talk about what we need to talk about. And that is. Texas football is the star is the sky following. Have we hit rock bottom? Is this just part of the rebuild? Steven, you ready? I'm ready. And we got to take a quick break. We got to pay our primary sponsor real quick. Texas Longhorn football with Steven and Gotti of the fanatic perspective. He has some educated and really valued thoughts and opinions on this. And it's coming up next. For all of your insurance needs, look no further than our primary sponsor, Jim Saxton State Farm Insurance Agency. The ATX OG has been insuring Austin for over three decades. And get this, Jim Saxton is a Longhorn legacy. He is the son of the late, great James Saxton, who was a Heisman finalist. Be sure to give him a call or better yet, visit his website, saxtoninsurance.com and tell him that the stories inside the Man Cave Boys Recommended you. All right, my man. There's the transition. It doesn't get any more dramatic than that. Where do we start? This Texas football program, should we go to a graphic? No, I think we need to hear an opinion. Some knowledge. I want Stephen and Gotti dropping some knowledge on the people who follow stories inside the Man Cave podcast about this Texas football team before we peel back some more layers. Absolutely. So, Sean, we're at a point here, and I, you know, it's it's been one of the most challenging things being a YouTuber is the live show reactions we do right after these games, and it's been tough. Um, if anybody told you that they thought we'd be here after 
our last win, let's start here. Our last win was TCU, right? So if you thought the last time you saw Texas win a football game would be at TCU against a coach that's been, you know, let go. They've parted ways, right? The two, the two wins we got in the conference, TCU and Tech, they've, they've, those coaches are now gone. It seems like it was last season. This whole season, that second quarter against Oklahoma where – we are everything all gas no brakes is encompassing is there and the comeback happens against us and we start blowing leads week over week and the belief the confidence we have been through a journey with this football team and i think it's you know however what it, i think it really depends and i'm challenging the fans it depends on what type of person you are if you're a glasses half full type person if you're a glasses half empty type person because if you're a glasses is half full type person, you could say, hey, we 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 were covering some things up, whether we were going to win those games. Right. And and a lot of this stuff needed to really come out ugly. We needed to be embarrassed. We needed to 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 re. I hate to say the R word, but rebuild. And Sark today, it is his Monday presser as we're recording this, said that. I mean, not not in those exact words, I'm paraphrasing, of course, but rebuilding and, and really starting from the ground up in this program. Now, you know, if it's more, you know, you're on the more negative side of things, then you say, well, what what's the credibility of this staff at this point? How do we not start to consider moving on again, right? How can PK keep his job as the defensive coordinator? Steve Sarkeesian, you know, we already were shaky and questionable about your head coaching resume coming in here, and now we're headed towards four, five win at best season. So I think it depends on oh, – some of this depends on what perspective you as a fan have. If you're happy that they're finally going to get down and strip this thing down the stubs and build it properly with good administration, CDC, Jay Hartzell, we feel like we got the admin stuff – that's been really shaky throughout the 2010, Sean. You know this better than I do. <laughs> it's, you know, because you can look at the good, stable programs, and you can look at Texas, and you do the math. Or you can say, hey, we're, we're, we're going to continue on the coaching carousel at the University of Texas. Depends on your perspective. And that, you made a great point, um, the alignment. And I know when, when uh, Herman – I know That's he had weird. some one-liners. Alignment, winning is hard. And there was another one, kind of like Bob Stoops had, certainly. Okay, Big 12 championships, but those are okay because he was winning, all right? But alignment, it, I have to agree with Tom. Alignment is key, and you nailed it right there. Alignment, I, I, this is just my opinion. This is not fact. This is all fallout. I, in my opinion, I think I've been saying it, and I know you have been saying it as well. I think this is fallout from so many years of not having that alignment mm -hmm. and having so much turnover from border regents, uh, president, AD, head coaches, OCs, DCs, position coaches. You heard Sarkeesian today. There are 60 or seniors on this team. This is their third head coach, and he acknowledged it. That's not that's not conducive to success, in my opinion. I mean, am I wrong to think that way? Absolutely not. I mean, Steve said no kid goes to college thinking they're gonna play for three different head coaches. That's not what you're that's not what they're selling to you when you're 17, 18 years old, sitting there at Anderson High School, go Trojans, right? That's not what they're selling to you when they're coming to talk to mom and dad, Sean. You're thinking that this person, like, even if you're a parent, right? right? Like, let's look at a lot of you guys listening are parents. You guys are handing your, your, your kid over to hopefully be molded into a successful young man. What do you mean that guy's not here 12 months from now? <laughs> 12 months. Where'd he go? <laughs> <laughs> and there's people who, who actually think, I know you've heard them. I'm trying to tune it out. I'm trying to, you know how you have, you can have tunnel vision. I'm trying to have tunnel audio. I hear people saying, and I had to walk out of the stadium, and I got to admit it right now, right here. I, 
I left a game for the first time in my life early as a fan. The Kansas game. Yeah. Number one for what I was watching, but number two, I couldn't stand what I was hearing around me. People were saying, mm. Sark's got to go. Man, Sark, we need to fire all the coaches until we find the right ones. And I'm like, that's the most surface level, uneducated point of view I've ever heard. You can't keep firing people. That's what's wrong with Texas. No, I mean, people come here because they're taking your money. Mm -hmm. And, but it hasn't really helped their career after Texas either. Their careers, plural. Um, but it, it's just, that is a, and I, I know I use this term too much, and I would love your take on this. Uh, the residual, systemic, residual systemic issues. That's what we're dealing with right now. You got to clean all that crap out of there. Because it is, in an email like I sent you the other day, this is hot garbage right here. This is the hot garbage they're trying to put down the drains like they do at four in the morning on Bourbon Street in New Orleans. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, I mean, you're looking at, I think, I think everything goes downhill, right? To that point, you know, everything goes downhill, right? So the players eventually get impacted by it. And you start to have, yeah, you have negativity. You have resentment in the locker room. You have people that are, that had goals and aspirations. You also have kids who are just thrilled to be at the University of Texas, right? And so it's like, hey, regardless of coaching change, regardless of what's going on, like, life's good for me, right? You know, I got everything I need, and, you know, I'm, I'm going to graduate from here, I'm having a good time, blah, blah, blah. So that culture, be, and, and th that starts to creep more and more through because a lot of kids are very impressionable. Right. When you don't have a culture of winning. When, when you're not used to winning, there's no standard to, to really hold anybody to. On top of the leaders being changed, every you know seemingly every year i mean because you think about tom herman's staff yeah he was still there and stan drayton was still there but everybody right. else he had already flipped over going into a covid season and then you come out of a covid season and now we're here with sark and, and pk and jeff choke and all these guys so i think at some point are we going to let people build or not are we going to let people you know, do it really, really, really do. And 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 that starts with the administration, Chris Del Conte, how good interference, you know, a good leader can shield their 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 personnel from stuff, right? And so Chris Del Conte right now, what I want Steve Sarkeesian focused on is developing this roster, is the transfer portal, is nailing his 2022 class and taking a full audit of what went wrong and what went right. I mean, I know it's crazy to say that with only four wins sitting here, but I watch, I mean, we're watching these games. I see what Steve is trying to do offensively, at least. Yeah. I see it. I see those elements. You can't ignore what Xavier Worthy is doing. You can't Ooh. ignore what B. John Robinson was doing before the injury. So there's stuff there, real, real stuff there for them to build on. But we've got to have, at this point, and Texas fans don't want to hear this, have some patience. Yeah, it is. You've got to have patience. And by no means was I calling the players hot garbage. These players came to Texas. You came to Texas with the intent of winning. Not one of them. Just like you mentioned, some have different mentalities because there is no winning culture here. That's the thing. If you go, I want I want people to follow Quandre Diggs, Aaron Williams. Uh, I wish. I wish DJ was on there, Derek Johnson. He's not a big tweeter, Twitterer, if mm -hmm. you will. But Quandre is – God, he has an old soul, old school from his brother, you know. And I like that. It's just like Quentin Jammer. And, and I remember the last interview with Quandre. You probably remember this. It's after the Arkansas debacle at the Texas Bowl. He says, man, there's, there's not enough people in there who want it. There's not enough people in there who losing hurts more than the desire to win. And there's just not enough people in there that want it and not enough people who are dogs. For those who don't understand what dogs mean, leadership, accountability of your teammates, and bring it every day. 
we're human. We're not going to be able to bring it every day, but there's not enough of those people on this roster, right, who are willing to put that in 80% of the time, at least during the week. That's just my opinion. I think that's more accurate than it's ever been at our at our program. And the leadership element, I think we we probably undervalued some of the guys that did leave um, recently, whether it's, you know, I call him General Ellinger, but whether it's Sam Ellinger, his leadership there, um, had a chance to sit down with Caden Stearns in the offseason, his leadership, Taquan Graham, who was a captain with that defensive line. This defensive line does not look the same without him. And then the best player we had on our team last year, you know, the two best players we had on our team, Joseph Osai and Sam Cosby. Yeah. Right? And so – it's not that you just lose their production. You lost. They control the locker room. Yes. They control practice. You don't have to police guys left and right, especially under, you know, and to Tom Herman, to be fair to Tom Herman, he was in year four at that point, even with the new staff, guys kind of know how things are going to go because Sam was a constant. Joe was a constant. Cosme was a constant. All those guys. Right. So, you know, you can't really, you know, mess around. But when an Xavier Worthy comes into your program and Xavier Worthy makes a comment and says, I can't make other guys play hard. And he's a true freshman saying that. I can't make other guys, like, think about the what he's saying, right? And so I agree with you that you're not calling the players hot garbage, but they are a part of the program. Correct. And the program itself has been this is a garbage product when you think of in the manner in which you guys have lost. So, you know, we got to we have to be we have to be honest. Nobody's ever going to take a shot at an individual player, individual kid. Right. I think it's fair to always critique uh what's going on on the field, but in terms of the overall product, I say all the time on my channel, football is a pass fail grade, Sean. It is. And it's a fail. Either you won or you lost. <laughs> There's no 4.0, there's no B, there's no average. Either you got the job done or you didn't. Um, today, uh, pre before we go into what you see on your screen here, I, I want to play this soundbite from after the most recent loss. Uh, today's press conference, the day this is recorded, his last Monday press conference, I thought Sark was the, the usual Sark, very uh, candid. I think he does a great job of communicating it to the most common listener viewer to help people understand. He knows how to communicate, but I just watch I, I, this particular soundbite after this loss at West Virginia. I, I just, maybe I'm looking at it too much from an old point of view from a former media members, but just watch his body language on how he describes the team. Uh, if, you, if you guys think that this coach and staff's not fully invested and cares and frustrated and is doing everything possible, I think you're wrong. Um, and I feel for those guys because they battle, they compete. I say it all the time. They come to work every day. Uh, they give us what they got. Um, and we just haven't broken through yet. And that's, that's the biggest frustrating part. In every game, it seems like there's a different story to tell of why that didn't happen, you know. And I, I hate it for the guys because they do bring it every day and they compete. Uh, I'm proud of them. I told them that because they could have folded the tent today and they didn't. And they battled their way back and they gave ourselves they gave themselves a chance uh, to be in that game late. Um, unfortunately, we just couldn't make the plays to, to do that. Steven, um, he said today, playing off that, he kind of chuckled because he went through every game and how the turning point of each game. And he said, and then we we come back, and uh, now we have injuries to both of our quarterbacks mm -hmm. and how the Kansas game ended up. And he went through each game and how each chapter of a book would be written to describe how they lost. It's the most bizarre. And the only thing you can say, have they hit rock bottom? I'd say yes in the modern era. You know, I thought rock bottom in the modern. So you think this is even further down than where we hit with with Charlie at the end? You think I, I we're think, there? 
I think considering I use the term that a lot of people use return on investment. Okay. Um, the amount of money, amount of time and effort and the, and, and the faith that uh, I think not only Sark, but everyone has poured into this program in particular, uh, I mean, uh, CDC and pouring into Sark to get this done. I think, being the most modern of modern eras, being the 21st century, this is rock bottom for a program like this because Texas can show up and win four games every year. You have that kind of talent that could probably go in and not be the best coach team and win three or four games. Right. Maybe five. Right. I mean, look at this graphic. I mean, this is sobering. It, it is very sobering. Um, I made a controversial statement after the Kansas game, and uh, you know, some a lot of people agree with me. I caught some flack for it, and I, I feel like you know, because I like you know, my earlier story in the first segment, I told you I moved to Austin, you know, 2012, right after I came and visited in 2011, right? So yeah. that entire period of time, I saw the end of the Mac Brown era, the Charlie Strong era, Tom Herman, now Sark, and what you know that's off the heels of of the national championship and everybody loves to point to that that Alabama game and and everything that was going on then right but when we really look at what we've seen here as the decline has happened we've always said something as Texas fans and and I and what I said was we got to stop saying oh if we keep this up we're going to be Tennessee or if we keep this up we're going to be Nebraska Bro, we are already there. <laughs> what are y'all talking about? Are we that delusional? <laughs> like, we're already there. And I keep telling people, I'm like, I'm, you know, we, we, between the two of us, we, we, we're college football fans. We've seen a lot yeah. going on in terms, not just Texas football, but the entire sport. Tennessee, Peyton Manning days, when they won the Fiesta Bowl and the national championship with T. Martin. They were primetime television at one point in time. Yeah, they oh, were. Oh, believe it or not. They were there. Oops. Look look at uh, – uh, uh, oh, go go ahead with the graphics, Sean. I'm sorry. Well, no, no, no. I'm placing that to give you some perspective to what you're saying. Look at this. I mean, Man. let's – let's 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 okay, put, put the Buckeyes aside just for a second. Let's look yeah. at the team – up north, the team across the 50 in Dallas that we go and play every year, right? The pr- people we recruit against, especially in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, the 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 team that I feel like most Texas fans, if we do measure – because, you know, 11 different teams can say that Texas is their main rival. But from a standpoint of what Texas fans look at, we're constantly looking at OU. They've won the conference six times in a row. They're going for number seven, right? So look at this. this and this, like you said, 1980, so last – what, 30, 31 seasons. And that includes that 90s period of of the Sooners being down too, right? Yeah, that short time frame, uh, 95 to 98. Mm -hmm. Stoops' first year was 99. Mm -hmm. And then he won in 2000. It's, I mean, Blake could recruit, but it just wasn't a very good head coach. Mm-hmm. God rest us. I think he is no longer with us. God yeah, rest, rest in peace, John Blake. Mm-hmm. But look it, at it's this. Just the number of four and five lost seasons. So essentially, what I mean by four plus 24 with seasons with four, at least four losses, and then another tier of five plus. So that could be five to seven losses. Um, and you, Texas AM has. Less losing seasons during this same time frame. That's 10 more four loss seasons than OU, right? If we're just looking at OU. Also, yeah. if we're talking about four loss seasons, I'm pretty sure. And, and look, we all enjoyed that 2018 Sugar Bowl season. We lost four games that year, right? So that's still – that even, even – like if you're saying – that's the best season we've had in the last 12 years. And that's still in this category, Sean. Yeah. But we were the same fan base back in 01 that was angry after we would go 11 and 2. Terrible. 
right? Terrible. And I understand perspective changes. The conference changes. We ought to have respect for the conference. You know, Baylor and all these schools weren't like that. But TCU wasn't even in the conference. <laughs> so I, I understand things have changed. However, Texas, we are already at that point. Please, please understand this. I had a lot of people push back at me and say, well, we'll never be at the, we're not at the level of Nebraska and Tennessee because we have more uh, a fertile recruiting base. Well, doesn't that make it worse? <laughs> Am I tripping? Doesn't that no. make it worse? Here's my thing for you. <laughs> and, and for people watching and listening, and God, he's not trying to piss people off. He's he's telling facts. And I think if I'm going to jump on the side, the fan side of me, and leave objectivity away here and just let it go, let's be. How about how about as a fan base, the Texas fan base, come together and just acknowledge, look in the mirror, all of us, all of us who follow this team, and say, listen, we are, we are not who we think we are. We have a ton of financial resources. Mm -hmm. We spend a lot of money and we get a nice chunk of change on that ROI. And that logo is mighty powerful. And this football program can win. And when it does, when it is, it's beautiful. It's better for college football. College football is better when Texas is nine, 10 wins. But that graphic you and I just talked about and saw. It's like riding the shock wave or whatever that roller coaster ride is was at the old Six Flags up in Arlington. We are Tennessee to an extent in Nebraska. We just haven't taken as many dips. Right. I mean, we're on par. Honestly, A&M and Texas are the same program except Max Run. 0109 was on a much different level. But isn't 98 to 09, nine plus win seasons? You can't say AM can't say that. But since 1980, AM can say that. And and we look, I know we'll, you know, we make ourselves feel better. We'll go on LA Chin and replay the 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 Rose Bowl and Vince Young running in and Keith Jackson calling us beautiful. <laughs> look, I'm a Texas fan. But like you said, you have to look yourself in the mirror. If you want things to change, you have to acknowledge what the problem is. You have to die. Not even just what the problem is, because if we all knew what the problem is, we'd fix it, right? Yeah. It's not, I'm not trying to oversimplify it either. Like, it is a nuanced thing. I do think having solid administration and stability up top helps. I do think that gives backbone to your coach. I think that then a coach with backbone can recruit the players he needs and make the proper evaluations for his staff, as well as holding the players accountable to execute what he's asking them to do. So it's a chain of command. It's it's a layered approach. Texas has been bad up top, so don't be surprised when things are not going well with the personnel, with the players, right? So, but as as fans in terms of how we assess things, because one thing that I, I, I kind of stumbled into this past week was, are we, like, even this, no one expected us to be at four wins, no one expected us to be heading into West Virginia to stay alive for bulgeability before the season. But if you go back and revisit a lot of people's expectations, mine included, it's like, why, how, why were we so off? Right. And so I had this team as a nine and three team coming into the season. I sound yeah. crazy now. I look <laughs> crazy now. Right. But my expectations, and I think all of us, we've been, we've had this thing with the last four bowl games. Where we go 4 0 and it turns into fool's gold because the best way to get yourself amped up and start drinking the Kool Aid in the spring is coming off bowl performances. And this, this bled into the quarterback situation with Casey Thompson and Hudson Card because what was the key data point in the Hudson Card Casey Thompson debate? It's Colorado, it's the Alamo Bowl, right? But it wasn't just him, it's B. John Robinson running wild, it's the offensive line looked fantastic. Defense was getting turnovers, but it was fool's gold. The year before against Utah, I thought that was the takeoff point. I did too. I, right? That was a good Utah team. It was very good. They were top, you know, they were what, number 11 or 12? They were they were up there. They got had guys go to the league. 
Shoot, Tyler Huntley just started for the Baltimore Ravens he yesterday. Sure did. <laughs> and Texas was all on that ass all night in that in that Alamo Bowl game. <laughs> Insane. It, but my point is, we would take those bowl wins, and our expectations would all of a sudden it's like you know what things click right we get this this and this ninth and and a lot of fans think that way that's not unique to texas fans let's let's be real there that's that's but i think we have to be we have to understand and and say all right we're not at that oklahoma level right now we yes we have the resources yes we know we get the talent in here but until we're able to put together an organization and an organization that can then produce a football team. Cause right now we have a bunch of people that are talented people. And then, and then they're not playing together. Right. And so all of those things have to be incorporated. We got to take steps, but some, some of us want to skip steps. It's a cycle, but the, the key now is for Texas fans to hope that once the cycle is back up, that it is calibrated to a point to where it is residual, residual success, not residual systemic issues. And let's face it, Baylor's a better program right now, too. In, in, in the short term, they've been in the short term, three yes. or two different rebuilds. I can't, I don't know where to put my fingers. <laughs> <Everybody>? Hey. <laughs> hey. Before we wrap things up, man, I've got two things I really want to talk to you about. One of them is a, a thing we do at the end, but I think this subject you'll have some uh, some opinions on, some uh, valued opinions on. <music> Stephen and Gotti, Dallas Cowboys, look, they did look like hot garbage yesterday, but C.D. Lamb, I, I'm pretty sure he's in the uh, – concussion protocol now he is uh gregory for on defense was not playing uh zeke was not himself zach martin was abused which is unlike him and i think the left side of the line was having some issues too what do you read now that's two out of the last three games in which the cowboys have really been brought down to earth yes What's your opinion? Is should we pause any thoughts on Super Bowl expectations? Here's the reason why I can't pause, and it has nothing to do with the Cowboys. It's the rest of the league. I asked this question to a lot of people yesterday, and I and it started at a little Thanksgiving get together I was at, and it, and because we were watching the Cowboys game, and everyone's freaking out, you know that you know we're our offense can't get anything going, and we're struggling, and I'm like, well, you know, look at the Chiefs. On the other side, you know, they got $500 million quarterback over there, Patrick Mahomes, Dak and Mahomes combined for no touchdowns, five turnovers and eight sacks between those two. You think about the money at the quarterback position between them. I understand they're both dealing with circumstances. Totally get that. You you just named a lot of the personnel that was missing, missing on top of us, making a line change that didn't make a lot of sense to me in the, you know, <laughs> during the week. <laughs> and it, I'm not look. I'm not trying to cap for my boy Connor Williams. That's not what this is about. I'm just a fan of if you're going to change a lineman, change him when you have your left tackle in there and he can communicate with him, versus changing him to communicate with Terrence Steele, who's your backup left tackle, on the road in Kansas City. That didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. But y'all want to roll with it, go with it. Bigger, bigger Earl. thing is this though. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Sean. No, no, Arrowhead Stadium is not the place to put in somebody who has communication issues. No. It's the right loudest place in the NFL. <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying. That's not even on the player at that point. I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> but my bigger thing is this. We had the number one scoring offense going into KC. We scored nine points. Buffalo Bills. They led the league uh, in scoring defense. They gave up 41 to the Colts. The Rams are on a bye. They got blasted the last two weeks, and they've souped up their team, right? They over here signing OBJ with Bitcoin. They got uh, Von Miller. <laughs> they got all these dudes out here, and all of a sudden they can't move the ball to save their lives with Sean McVay <laughs> running this thing, right? And so 
I don't know who to trust in this league. And because I don't know who to trust, all I can go by is what are people's ceilings? Right. What are people's ceilings? And what I did see yesterday was this Cowboys defense – because the reason why the Cowboys have struggled in playoff games is when it's really been the defense has struggled against other elite quarterbacks, specifically Aaron Rodgers. But this defense is different from 2014. This defense is different from 2016. And it's led by Micah Parsons. A bad Ooh, boy. Beast. Beast, man. I wish we had more guys like him. But I'm not pausing yet. Just because the rest of the league. Every week, how do you pick the games every week, Sean? Yeah, it's, I hate using the overused term parity, but that's what it is. It, and this is the time of year when teams start have you start having people with a lot of red crosses on their uh, IR list or cannot play. It's just, and now we have a seventeen game schedule. I think the Cowboys go twelve and five. It's a good year. I think if I'm the Cowboys, for me. The only place, like, let's say we don't get home field. Let's say Arizona runs away with it or whatever. The only place I'm not trying to go is Green Bay. Oh, God. He caught if, it, if damn I'm it. in the NFC. Dez caught it, damn it. <laughs> I don't mind them coming to Dallas, but I know I can win. I, I feel like I could win in Arizona. I could win a playoff game in Arizona because the rest of the places aren't weather problems. Yeah. If I go to Green Bay, you know, I had to play in the snow or now, now that's a. <laughs> I, I'm having flashbacks. I, I'm still angry. I've not let that go. I need a therapist to let that go. Let go of things which do not serve me in a positive way. Green Bay. I, I can't get rid of that image. The replay w occurred 17 times. It still replays in my head. It was an athletic move. You still don't know what a catch is. None. I know that was a catch, but. I'll know. tell you, I'll tell, I do know this was a fabulous episode, and this is how we're going to end it right here. Hey, Ben, tell me something good. Real quick, my friend, tell me something good. Sponsored by our guys, Cosmic Coffee and Beer Garden. Stephen and Gotti, wealth of knowledge dropped tonight. Let's polish it off by telling us, telling me and the people something good. Guys, I just want to say, first off, you know, it's a week of thanks, right? And, and, and we're recording this week of Thanksgiving. And I couldn't be more, more thankful, A, to have the platform we have and to be on this, this podcast. And, you know, a lot of transition going on in my life this year. Leaving Austin, Texas, first time homeowner. Uh, lost my mother to COVID this year. So a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of mm -hmm. of life, uh, good, good and bad. But um, one of the things that I can have perspective with is just our friends and our family, and our loved ones. And, and really, this year, I've really gotten a really good handle just on how to handle my mental space. And, you know, as you guys are watching sports, because sports can impact your mental space, believe it or not. The ups and the downs. Um, you know, I respected where Sean came from, where he was talking about the noise around him, right? And, and really learning to protect that. That's something I advise to all young athletes, um, those of you who are in corporate America, co-workers, all of those things. Please protect your mental space and, you know, really enjoy yourself during these holidays. Be intentional about, you know, who you're talking with, who you're dealing with, and who you're sharing things with. But it's been a wonderful week of thanks. Sean, thank you so much for having me on this Absolutely. platform. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Stephen and Gotti, follow them on Twitter, uh, Instagram, and the Fanatic Perspective on YouTube. I'm, I'm not just saying it because he's on here and that uh, we got to promote our guest, but seriously, subscribe to it. You'll either get a laugh or you'll learn something from it, or both. I usually have both, but I'm a goofy guy. And real quick for me, uh, uh, just like Stephen said, I lost one of my best friends this year and his wife due to COVID. It's, it's really changed my perspective. Be thankful for every moment, every opportunity in life, and to surround yourself with positivity. And for Stephen and for the OGs of the stories inside the man cave, Big Mike, Coach Mo, and Harbaugh Harge, we are out. Yes.
You see the drippy, I'm fitted up. Hop in my car and the giddy up.